This week on The Breakdown, we celebrate the big and bold life of Andy Hayden. Blaine Jackson joins the panel as we debate the controversial calls from the weekend. And Blackburn's coach Glenn Moore gives us the lowdown on the upcoming Farah Palmer Cup. Kia ora, hello and welcome to The Breakdown. Well, if the players are tired, you wouldn't have thought it after another fantastic weekend of Super Rugby Aotea Oroa and the two teams that were on the road have impressive performances and I'll tell you what, people are putting up their hands left, right and centre. They want selections, they want opportunities, whether it's north-south, whether it's an all-black jersey or just an opportunity to play each other once again. I've got a proposal, JK, and you'll love this one. We know the last game, the last of this competition is the Crusaders taking on the Blues at Eden Park. By the way, 33,000 tickets already sold for a game that's over, or just under two weekends away. Fantastic. How about we just make it a final, JK? The no, Blues and Crusaders. It is a final. Yeah. What? Well, New Zealand tradition, you've always always played touch. It's always last try wins. So, Razor, I will buy you a new surfboard if it's, you know, if you win this you weekend, have... probably. Yeah, who knows? Is... Come up, put it all on the line. It is a final, people. Well, you it take is. bonus points out of it. You go, you get to the last weekend, Mills, and he's offering up a Mills, surfboard. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know whether he's playing. Uh, that's the one way. That's the one way to get to Razor, though. Straight away, straight in for a surfboard. What about it? You know, you put it all on the line in the last I, game. I don't think it would matter to the Crusaders whether they win this week and, and come up to Eden Park and play that last game. They'll treat it as a final because they won't want to lose that last game of the season. Exactly, that's what I'm saying, Mills. So it is a final. <laughs> it's a final. Forget everything else. Glenn Jackson's coming to the studio and he's looking at us going, really, we're just trying to make change the game, mate. You know, we're not happy the way things have gone, but it's been a fantastic competition. Would you like to see it come down to the last game? Oh, wouldn't it be awesome? I, I don't know who would ref it. Obviously, there's a fair bit you going are, oh, hey, By the way, <laughs> so, uh, we're going to breaking news. If it happens, like, you're the one that's got the whistle. But, uh, you know, it's all pointed to the last game on a Sunday, Arvo. How good, you know? So, um, Highlanders this week, the Crusaders, no pushover, but obviously uh, going to that last game would be huge. Yeah, and the form of both sides on the weekend, irrepressible. But first, before we look back at the weekend, what we are going to do, Bernie, we're going to look and remember and celebrate yeah, one of our finest, one of our very finest All Blacks. Yeah, we've lost a real icon of the sport, haven't we? Andrew Maxwell Hayden, born in Whanganui, 1950. The promising lock first appeared on the rugby radar in 1971, standing an imposing six foot six tall or 1.99 metres. Ponsonby's new recruit was big in stature and intellect. Hayden made the All Blacks in 1972. His first trot for the ABs was in the Big Apple against New York Metropolitan, but it would take another five years before he'd make his test debut. Fast forward to 1977, Wellington, where Hayden earned his test stripes against the British and Irish Lions. Hayden played all four tests, the ABs winning the series 3-1. His line-ups, an art form. His scrummaging, uncompromising. But Hayden was capable of heroics and also dramatics with his notorious line-up dive in 1978 that some believe denied Wales its first win since 1953 over the ABs. Few Welsh fans have forgotten, even fewer have forgiven. But Hayden wasn't a man for regrets. If that got the Welsh talking, 1981 had the whole world talking. Hayden, part of the hugely controversial Springboks tour of New Zealand, which provoked nationwide protest and global condemnation. But it was a pressure cooker time that Hayden says delivered some of the best rugby he's ever experienced and a groundbreaking time where players found their voice. There is no more difficult time to find concentration than when it's most needed. Mm. And that time, it was most needed because of the amount of distraction. We were able to create a new atmosphere, a different atmosphere, and something that was a lot more um, like the environment that I wanted to be part of. And I think that mm. became very much a player-driven environment. Um, and I see that in, in the environment that the players are operating in today. And with that stark resolve, the Cavaliers emerged. And in 1986, Hayden was instrumental in rallying a rebel side to tour South Africa, the tour breaching a ban on sporting contacts with the apartheid regime. Controversy was never far from the big man on or off the field, and he never dodged it. He was a forerunner for change. 
When accepting royalties from his autobiography, Boots and All, he rallied against rugby's strict amateur rules, changing his occupation on his passport from professional rugby player to author. Athlete, author, promotions and talent manager. He demanded excellence in business just as he did on the field. He's the man behind the classic All Blacks, and many a story has been left behind in Bermuda and around the globe. Andy Hayden captained the All Blacks eight times. His last test appearance was in 1985 against Argentina. That year was his final season with Auckland, a year they took ownership of the Ranfurly Shield, finished second in the national championship, while his club Ponsonby cleaned up everything. He left at the top on his terms. 117 matches, 41 tests, and a few ruffled feathers along the way. The towering lock is considered one of the greatest ever All Blacks. His passing leaves a legacy based on courage, change, and controversy. The passport is now closed. The final stamp has been made. What a journey, Andy Hayden. All Black, 716. Yeah, but he was a colossus and a legend in the game of rugby. Uh, he was ahead of his time in the game of rugby. Um, he stood up for players. Um, he took on officialdom, but he always did it for the right reasons. Um, and he was just a fantastic rugby player and, and off the field a gentle giant, a fantastic man. He could read the game really, really well and, uh, and he would take it upon himself to control the game. And he was very good at controlling the game, just him up front with his big forwards. And uh, the backs got the ball when they needed to get the ball, and, but he knew how to work the forwards really well. He had very high benchmarks and standards, and, and I think that's another reason why we were really good in those Auckland days. And um, again, I think it's trickled down into the Blues now, and, and even New Zealand rugby even, even more so. One thing Andy did is connect people, and he connected them. Um, fish as rugby as the vehicle and then look after you and uh, he looked after me yeah he, he was the trailblazer he stood up for what I believe um, a lot of us probably didn't have the uh, the kudos or, or what was going on we were just more important and more keen on playing rugby but uh, he saw that uh, it wasn't fair and he set about uh, rectifying that on Saturday he was playing for Harlequins and on Sunday he was playing for Rugby Roma and he had trained for Rugby Roma for two days there, fly back and train the last day for the Quins, play Saturday again, play Sunday back in Rome. And so he was a real entrepreneur in, in the way he was jumping around the world, playing money, uh, playing, playing rugby and probably getting to pay shitloads for it. <laughs> he, he wanted to involve families and partners a lot more in the game. He, he wanted players to have more of a say. And uh, so has the game moved in his direction? Yes, it has. And so he was more than just a manager. The, the thing that I loved most about Andy was he would tell it to you straight. He would also tell you what was coming. And he was also aspirational in thinking what was, you know, what was the next thing one could think about in their career. A big part of his legacy is um, you know, what we're enjoying now and, and where we sort of find ourselves. And even at the pointy cutting edge of professionalism, um, he was way ahead of his time. And, and he really did um, you know, challenge uh, the norm and the convention and because of that um, you know I think we grew up a lot quicker as New Zealand rugby and our game and, and we're enjoying the benefits of great men like him who, who were way ahead of their time. Oh, I had the great opportunity to be around Andy Hayden a lot whether it's playing golf or around events and JK you need people who can lead change who can drive things and he was that sort of man that's what Andy Hayden brought when I saw him and the fact that he always had he was always looking at things a little bit differently but it was easy to support him and get it behind them, but quite often it was around common sense. And he wasn't afraid, though, to put it out there and challenge everyone around him. Yeah, it was a really sad day yesterday. Um, you know, he was a really important man in my life. Um, I only played with him a couple of years, but he was present all through my life. And um, he taught me so many important things, a brilliant role model. Uh, him and Trish were incredibly good to my wife and I, especially when we were struggling in the early parts of our relationship, because English and different countries. So, really important man to me. But um, I'll tell you a story when I was 18, Mills. Um, I'm in the team, and, uh, and big, I called him Big Critic, called me Lean Dog. And so he said, uh, Lean Dog, you've got to go and talk to that guy over there, right? And I'm, I'm looking up and I'm looking over, and it's. Prime Minister Muldoon. And I was like, I'm not going to talk to him. He said, if you don't go and talk to him, you're not playing next week. And I said, I said, you're not the coach. And he said, Hardy, 
and called Hardy over and he said, if JK doesn't talk to Muldoon, he can't play next week. Is that right? And Hardy went, yeah, that's right. So I had to go <laughs> yeah. and talk to Prime Minister Muldoon. And to be fair on Prime Minister Muldoon, he was amazing to me because he's a politician. But it, it, it changed the way I was. I mean, I was a shy young man, you know, and he, he did that. My first test match. Um, so I'm over the moon, right? And back in those days, we'd get together on a Wednesday afternoon, midday, and you play Saturday. So I get down there, I'm just, you know, incredibly excited. And we have our first training run and Andy calls me in and says, JK, uh, we're not playing on Saturday, we're striking. And I said, what? <laughs> we're striking? He said, yeah. Um, and I'm gonna, cause the Adidas boot deal, you know, they're getting all the money. So I'm gonna wear one laser boot and one Adidas boot and we're all striking. And Max is going, yeah, 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 we're striking. I'm, going, no, I'm just going to, I'll play in bare feet, you know? So, um, but he was just such a beautiful man. You, you, you had to be strong of character, but if you're strong of character and stood up for him and stood up for yourself, he, he really respected that and he wouldn't hold it against you. It wasn't personal. He just wanted you to be, show your character and really really be yourself and all the things that people said before was so true. Trailblazer. Uh, as former players post your career the last 20 years, Jacko, you get an opportunity to maybe be a part of the classic All Blacks, which is something that he grew, that he he gave you an opportunity to be a part of, whether it was in Bermuda. I was grateful to get an opportunity, well, I thought I'd be grateful in 2011, it was to play for the classics against Japan, which Sir John Kern was coaching, thinking I would get an easy ride, not knowing that JK was going to select a 110 kg winger from Tonga to play on his <laughs> left wing. That was your parting gift to me in my rugby career. But the tour and the camaraderie and the classic All Blacks, he, he was bringing guys together post their career to enjoy the great things about rugby and about being part of a team. And Jacko, you, you, you benefited from it. I, I never made the cut for Bermuda for, for obvious reasons because my off-field performances obviously weren't strong enough. That's why you're an obvious selection. <laughs> off the you were field. too scared. You just said that before. Yeah, and absolutely, 100% uh, right. Bills, you're the same. I think it's a tough, it's a tough rig going to Bermuda. Do, yeah. um, you know, first of all, uh, there's obviously the, the work with the boys, which is, uh, I think I put on four kilos in about two days of, of uh, having a good time with your mates. Then the golf. Golf is uh, number one. Critical. Number one for Andy. Yep. And then there's rugby. And as you said, pulling those guys together, I was lucky enough to play it uh, just before reffing, so I'd finished my rugby career. There, but come out and what Andy did to bring those guys together, and, and people just really wanted to go out there and play for Andy. You still had to have pride in the jersey, though, right? Oh, Even though, yes, you'd gone and had a lot of fun outside of the lines and, and when you weren't on the field, you still had to go in front up. And I think that was critical in, in why those teams, one, were successful, but also the camaraderie between them was the fact, you know what, no matter what had gone on, you still went out there and represented a black jersey. 100%. And um, our, we actually won, thank goodness, and made the final. But I remember in the hotel, we're in this five-star hotel and everyone's around and making a bit of noise and Andy wanted to give us our last-minute speech and there's people paying thousands of dollars for this hotel. And he just turned around and told them all to shut up. <laughs> I'm having a big meeting about a <laughs> game winning. Critical. Everyone came up Absolutely and looked at it and they were like, no problem, sir, we'll no, carry on. So no. it was, uh, you know... The, 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 the manner of the bloke is just incredible. I mean, for you, JK, and you talked about the influence he had on you. There were, there were so many ways that, though, he, he could, I suppose, he could bring people around him, bring them close. Even the fact that, yes, you know, he was a little bit different and he challenged you. You just wanted, I, I always felt I wanted to be around him because I knew there was always going to be great conversation. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'll, I'll just tell you another a little story about, you know, early, early days, go to Whangarei to play Northland, game's over. And Andy comes to us and says, we're not going inside. We're going to have a beer outside the doors because they won't let our wives and partners in. You know, when you're 18, you're going, you don't know who to... You know, the manager's going, we've got to go inside. And Hayden's going, no, we're, we're staying outside. We all stood outside for the whole after-match function, listening to the speeches. So he was really strong like that. But I loved going around to his place and listening to his stories. He was a great storyteller. Loved stories, loved getting people together, loved listening to stories. He just really, really enjoyed that side of, you know. Well, I didn't, I didn't know him very very well. And for, for a long time, like you said, said uh, Jack, I dodged that sort of email that came out about Bermuda or to going out to the classic All Blacks. But I bumped into him last year in Fiji and he came across like that. He asked how the family was or we're in the swimming pool. And he was just talking away as if I knew him, you know, uh, for a very long time. But what sort of, I suppose, hit me was the fact that it it wasn't just um, being able to get these All Blacks together and go over and have uh, a connection and play rugby and, you know, do the off-field stuff, but it was also to give them an opportunity, you know, to meet different people. So when they say that he was ahead of his time in terms of the opportunities that came with business, that was certainly what sort of came across to me, that that's what he was trying to do for the others in this club. 
Totally, and you know, we're talking about a Pacific Island team. You, you go to, to Fiji, they call him Ratu Andy Hayden, because he, he's the first one to try and help. Fiji especially had a, you know, had a long relationship with Fiji. So he had this, he, he was a contrast of, you know, like some people would be scared of him, but like I said, had this heart of gold and you just had to earn his respect. So if you didn't, if you said, didn't say something to his face and he heard about it later, he'd have a go at you, you know, and good on him. I love that about him. You turned down Bermuda. I turned down when Sporting Contacts, they contacted me about Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> That's what I turned that down. I don't know why you keep calling, Chris, but I'll tell you what, I'm done. That's it. <laughs> maybe a Dean, maybe Mills is ready don't, to don't go. I think he's ready. He wants an opportunity. But you talk about taking a stand, you would have to say on the weekend if you wanted a performance out of his team out of the Blues he would have been incredibly proud of the way they fronted in Dunedin over the weekend Just before things start here we're going to take a moment to pay tribute to a colossus of the rugby game Andy Hayden a dominant and inspiring figure on and off the field Does this feel like one of your more complete performances in the season? I think it does. Caleb Clark accelerating. Oh, finding it. Christie's going to get a second. No. Gives it to Fahani. He's in. I was happy that they dug in deep and we had the mental fortitude to back ourselves. Barrett thought about another kick. Then fires a great pass over the top. Tony Lamborn back in front of Clark. Christie. Can he get it down? Yes. Great success here, but luckily, <laughs> oh, inside for more of the footwork and the support playing. I'm looking for the corner. Brilliantly worked. Lay up, punishing the Crusaders. Just the footwork of Richard Wonga. Well set up. It was again a set play move. Fainan Nuku still had some work to do, but that big and strong, that close to the line. So they get the ball back from the kick. Those were your two game changers this week. Head to facebook.com forward slash two degrees to vote for your pick. We'll name the winner in the build-up to the Chiefs versus Crusaders match on Saturday. Up for grabs, 12 months of two degrees mobile and broadband. A Samsung phone plus a field replica super rugby jersey from your favourite team. What a weekend, some great action, some controversy. That's just the way it works with super rugby Aotearoa. Let's talk moments. Let's talk about the big plays we saw from the weekend, and I love a learning experience. I really do. And it happened maybe for a whole Highlanders forward pack, but for young Aidan Johnson on the loose head prop side, and it's off to Anga Fossi at the peak of his talents. So and just watch when he stands up here. He actually helps the young man up. Gives him a pat on the head. <laughs> Johnson wanders back. And I'll tell you what, I was standing. I was standing at the end of the field, JK, right there. And I'm looking at it, and there was actually a smile on Aiden Johnson's face. In fact, he knows what had just happened. And for me, when well, you talk about a young man facing that and playing against the guy who is undoubtedly, I believe, our best tight head prop right now, one of the best in the world, I think that's a great part of our game. And the fact that you can always accept the fact, you know what, today... Today I was beaten, and beaten by a better player. And especially props, they're real weird like that, eh? Like, <laughs> you, know, like, they, you just they, get angry. They just, you just know, get fired they just up. know it's going to happen. Like, the, the, the front row coach down there will actually be quite happy. It's all, it's all right, son. You know, it Dooms happens. wouldn't have liked it, but I tell you what, he'd have respect for what happened. But I tell you what, you had respect for something that happened after the game in Dunedin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Tony Brown, pull out the beard straight after a loss. Look at this. Loving it. <laughs> you know how many times I wanted to do that? I'll try to start. beer fridge. In the coach's box, or was that? That was your issue, mate. You didn't have a beer fridge in your in your in your box. I think this is a nice little just a wee space chili man in the background. Here. Was that before the game or after yeah, I just double sort of checked? <laughs> no, no, that wasn't. <laughs> that wasn't at all. Not at all. Mills for you. Well, for me, I'm going to have to go back to the guy you just spoke about, Offa Tuanga Fasi. Every week, I mean, you know, this week as well. It's almost like they want to test him and see whether he's still there. I mean, man. That's one way to test a big fella. And it's not against a skinny back that's running that sort of inside line either. Man. Oh. This is not the first time, though. This has been a regular occurrence over the last month. Every opportunity... 
Can you avoid this, Mills? Or is this just yeah, happening? Yeah, back, though. Yeah. Oh, once, maybe yeah, twice, once. but... Look at this. Out. Oh. Oh. <laughs> we... Gee, I'm glad oh. I don't play the game. Yeah. We stayed on the outside channel. I love the outside channel. Yeah. Ever so often in the middle, you had to face it. For you, what did you see on the weekend, Jacko? Oh, not too many times you see, you know, there's certain things that happen in the game of rugby you've just never seen before. And uh, mine's um, actually Aaron Smith, size six foot, under a, under a ball, stopping a try. I mean, that's a try all day long. And a guy's foot, he can't be, like I said, not much than a size six. To stop that try is pretty amazing. And uh, I remember watching it with my son thinking, well, there's not too many times you're going to see that in your life. I've never seen anything like in my life. Should never. it be banned? Other than you telling me about the time you tried to fake putting it down in the dead ball gear area and you put it on your foot and then took off and ran away and scored yeah, the try? Yeah, so you put, the foot, put it on your foot, go to the 22, everything's going to drop, kick it and whew, just so keep now, running. So now it's not banned? No. Nah, right. <laughs> <laughs> <Is this, laughs> <Yeah, laughs> spirit. I, I questioned the spirit of the game there, JK. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, we'll, we'll talk about, me, about that a little bit later. Bernie, you would have seen the weekend. What for you stood out? Oh, mine was undoubtedly the WWF moment. It was The Rock versus Hulk Hogan. Maybe not a fair analogy. But Brad Weber taking it to Sevu Reese. Up, oh, bit of a push over the hoardings. Now, it wasn't so much the push I had a problem with. Not cool. Uh, Sevu Reese, the Academy Award goes to the flying winger. He could have stopped himself. How many times? The man's an athlete. Jack, is that a penalty? Play on. It's great TV. I love it. You, say, it. you say everything play on. <laughs> <laughs> everything play on. I think it's great acting for me, JK. I love it. Yeah, no, as long as nothing happened afterwards. Like, I reckon he was doing it because of that stupid rule where you can run and jump and catch the ball. So he's probably thinking, Sevi Reese is going to get his feet off the ground and flick it back and someone's going to catch it. So he just pushed him a wee bit. I just think it was a half-back Mills. It's a halfback thing, man. Just get rid of him. Who cares? He didn't feel guilty yeah, at all. Yeah, no one's yeah. going to punish me. Look at ah. me. You know, I'm not going to get into me. Not at all. But I mean, we need to revisit the old fake uh, stuff that's going on in the game. <laughs> oh, really? I reckon. Are you sure? Oh, I'm not sure about that. I mean, look about the, the weekend, and we talk about the referee. Of course, there was some controversy. We need to talk about it, Jacko, because what I'm going to say to you right now is the fact that we underestimating the challenge of this competition. These are test match quality games. We've got five referees who have been going every weekend for the last eight weekends, put under high level pressure. Not just the guy in the middle, TMOs, assistant referees. Are we underestimating the challenge and maybe are our expectations too high? Uh, 100%. I, I think this is harder than any World Cup any of these guys will go to. And, and to have New Zealand teams just play each other and beat each other up like they're doing, it's phenomenal rugby. But referees like players need a bit of luck. And, and what, what happens in most of these games, you know, these decisions that we're talking about quite often, uh, uh, quite often sometimes just a bit of unluckiness. And what it happens in these games, it then becomes a massive talking point because of the result gets changed. So... Week in and week out, you know, I feel for these referees and how much they have to be put through and to, because the rugby is so good. The rugby is just in, intense, big moments in every game that can be under the microscope for, for a referee. And they're single moments. Let's look, say, at the first one that happened in Hamilton where uh, Sever Reese scores a try. The fact, I think it's Quinton Strange who looks to offload at Mills. When I watched this uh, firsthand, the first look at it, I said, oh, he's lost control of it and that's a knock-on. How did you see that? Just in there, when you look at it like that, I see it as a knock-on as well, and that's not that's not putting my chief's eyes on as well. I mean, it's you know, clearly obvious that it sort of went forward. You know, he didn't have, I think the biggest thing was he didn't have control of the ball. You know, that's the biggest issue. He didn't have control on the ball, and as you see him go forward, it does go forward. So, I, I suppose that the biggest thing was what he is he is he's backed his own decision. You know, he's he's gone out and, and, and said, well, maybe that from from where he was standing, he didn't go forward. There are always parts of games, J.K. Though that are subjective. That's the challenge of rugby, isn't it? The fact there are some that are always going to be up to some interpretation. Is that what makes our game unique? Yeah, it does. I think there's a couple of extra things that we need to talk about. Um, and this is to the players. Stop moaning at the refs. Stop being muppets. I think some people are a little bit out of control at the moment. You can see it. And you're teaching... I got told off once. A mother came to me and said, JK, can you stop spitting on the field? And I said, why? She said, because our under-8s are spitting on the field. Right? So I think the conduct of some of our players has been really average, putting pressure, extra pressure on the coaches. They make as many mistakes as the coaches, as, uh, as the refs, sorry. It's just that there's a, the, you know, these guys are in immense pressure. So stop being muppets. Stop yelling at the refs. Stop doing that stuff because it's not in our game. Stop faking stuff. So Aaron Smith, was that deliberate? What was that? We can probably talk about that a wee bit. But there's one thing that I'd like the refs to do, I believe. 
I think the yeah is that milked? Do we want that in our game? I mean, for your what's your instinct? Once again, I mean, is that yeah? You well, saw that firsthand. Well, this is the luck I'm talking about. Oh, you know, for me, it, it's offside. But we're playing on because there's, there's probably a bit of 50-50 of what happens. Like, did, was it there a um, bit of a mess? Yes, there was. This could have easily been picked up and the Highlanders score when we play on, it's no problem. Now there's an intercept. Now we have, oh no, now that replays come along, Mike Fraser's decision was play on, now he's sent on the thing and now we're going to the TMO. And then the decision's right, he's offside. So, so that's the luck I'm sort of talking about, that's not always you get as a referee. But we have to accept that, surely, surely. Oh, well, so, so we'll give, so we'll give benefit of the doubt. Yeah. We'll give you're benefit of the doubt to Aaron Smith right there. But Sebu Roos, does he need to jump over the awning? Yeah. But it's one of the things to that make I it look North, dangerous. I look at it in the fact that surely no coach is talking about the referees during the week because that's not why the Chiefs are losing. No. That's not why season sides are losing games. When you look at what's happened through the course of this competition, it's an 80 minute game. Absolutely. And I suppose the question is. You know, if you're talking about the pressures that the referees are under, you know, for so long we've been talking about the, the players adjusting. So are the referees not, not adjusting all of a sudden? To the, there's been no rule changes. They've just had a few adjustments with a few key rules. But all of a sudden, are they focused too much on those rules? They haven't sort of started backing themselves. I mean, in that last um, scenario where, where they, they called it back, he clearly said it was play on. But then it was almost like, oh, I, I better call it back just to have a little look and, and, and check. So from, what, from my point of view, it's almost like they've, they haven't backed their ability. And, they, and, and they're, 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 and they're watching it out. I think we've got to support them with it, JK. Yeah, but this how is, difficult this is. Part of my problem is that the irrelevant rules that sometimes the refs are plucking out of the game when you've been getting away with it all day. So that's my problem. You've been get, coming in from the side slightly and then late in the game it gets penalised. And I think that's frustrating for the players and that's frustrating for the coaches. And I think it's a bigger problem. Jack, I'm interested to see what you think because I think we should make more emphasis on how a referee refs and some of the trends he does, right? Because I think they're getting over-controlled about what they should control. And I think it's affecting some of our top refs' confidence. They go out and read the game. When you used to referee, I knew how you were going to referee. I knew some of the things that you were going to do. And the others were irrelevant and would say to the players, this is how Jacko refs. Stay within his rules and it'll be a good game. Because you did the same for the opposition. What so it looks like we're getting over... Uh, what's the word, Mills? You know, the, the, there's too much pressure on these guys to change what they're doing. They're just being themselves. As the last word for you, Jacko, then, what would your expectations be of the players and the coaches in terms of how they would expect to support the referees? Oh, look, J.K. makes a very good point. I mean, we, we heard a lot before this uh, tournament started that there was direction from uh, Ian Foster, from big coaches around how the game wanted to be played. Now, that's very hard for a referee going to an extremely tough, tight competition to get everything right and, get, and then be consistent through the season. And we probably have seen a little bit of slacking off. What, what I really love to see is a referee just going on instinct, you know, but with the media scrutiny and what ha happens in two of those decisions, probably they would have blown a whistle and played, but what happens then, you, you, you're second-guessing yourself, is this the right call? Is this... Then you're looking at the big screen and then, you know, you, you come up with a decision that some people um, see as an incorrect one. And, and it just... It's... And... It just carries on, doesn't it? And what we do know is that there's always two sides to every story and there's two set of supporters, right? And they're going to see the games differently. But from my point of view, I look at the effort they're putting in. The challenge of this competition, I don't think we should be overcritical of the fact that they're going out there on a weekly basis and I don't think it's denying teams the opportunity to be successful and win. Bernie, there's plenty more to talk about, plenty more news, but our friends across the Tasman as well, plenty to say right now. Yes, indeed, we'll get to that in just a second, but we've got an absolute pearl for you, Jeff and team. Uh, we get a few press releases here at the breakdown. I'll be honest, some go straight to recycling, most get it once over, but this one from the Taranaki Rugby Football Union was absolute gold. It's grassroots rugby at its very best, literally. Once assistant coach Neil Barnes finishes up with the Chiefs, who accidentally lost all their games. Um, he's going to be very, very busy. The Taranaki farmer, that's Barnes, will take the place of Craig Clark, who's unavailable due to the revised Mitre 10 cup start dates, impacting his farm operations. So Tim Stark will continue his coaching role as well as balancing his commitments as Deputy Principal at Francis Douglas Memorial College. Don't you love it? That is mucking in and multitasking, isn't it? Here's another belly roll for you, and Mills has dubbed it joke of the day. Um, former Wallaby Rod Kafer, he's made some pretty bold statements regarding the calibre of the Australian Super Rugby competition. Allow me if you will. 
But um, at the moment, um, our teams are playing well enough to give any in New Zealand a run for their money. I'm sorry, what? At the moment, um, our teams are playing well enough to give any in New Zealand a run for their money. I thought that's what he said. It appears he has backup, though. Aussie scribe Julian Linden writes, Super Rugby AU matches, they've been closer and more unpredictable, with 80% of games decided by less than 10 points. I'm not quite sure that close scoring matches constitutes a better game. He also criticises New Zealand's playing model that rids the competition of a final system. He's probably not alone there, though. But let's look at the competition. Super Rugby Aotearoa, two weeks to go. How's everyone placed? Crusaders ahead of the Blues by two points, but with two games still to play. The Blues with just one game remaining, and they have to wait until the final round to play it. So could the Canes, could the Hurricanes prove to be the spoiler? Two wins would have them level pegging with the Crusaders. So really, it's all on the Highlanders this weekend to roll the Crusaders. The Southern Brothers going at it. They will want the win. The other teams, they'll want the lifeline, but I'm just not quite sure... They all have the firepower to do it. Sorry, Goldie. Oh, we've worked this out. Worst case scenario, the Crusaders and Blues, regardless of the weekend, playing on the final day. So that's easy. We've got it worked out. But you're last right. try wins. Last try wins. <laughs> last, well, let's just last score wins. Yeah, exactly. Let's not last try. I mean, that would be stretching it just a little bit. Before we get on to some of that, what about Kafer? <laughs> what up to? We've had him on the show before. He's done a barbecue with Bashi. What more does he want? He wants to tell us, JK, that their teams are playing as well as we are. Well said. I appreciate what you call your comment there, Mills. We're going to get him on the show for you next week. I mean, you would have watched it, Jacko, some of it. Look, what is it, if we just quickly talk, what's the difference between the two competitions right now? As you see it, just as you're watching the games. Uh, crowds. That's Not a massive up. one. That's atmosphere. That's probably a big one. Um, yeah, the, the games have been tight, the Australian games. I mean, they've had two that's gone to extra time, I think. So, but like, like Bernie said... Did anyone want one of those? Does that make, yeah, does that make it a better game? I just... I don't see it as a better product at the moment. Um, they've got some good young kids. I mean, Dave Rennie will do a good job, but I just... You know, is it better than what we've got? Intensity, impact and skill level are the three things that I think there's a big difference. I'm going to challenge the Mills next week. Their champion can come over and challenge any of our teams any time they like. Any time, mate. Any, I mean... Let's, let's have him on next week and ask him those, ask him those questions. I'll tell you what, man, there was a massive laugh in the office today. <laughs> From Bills. <laughs> Emojis flying everywhere. <laughs> Mate, you are flat out. <laughs> All right, our spotlight for the week. We're going to focus on the three teams that are still alive, and we're going to talk about their seasons because they have been impressive in different ways. And we'll start with the three-time champions, of, well, the three-in-a-row champions, the Crusaders. Cody Taylor, of course, leading them from the front in their performances. But, Jacko, has this looked like the same Crusaders dominance that we've seen in the last three seasons, or are they still trying to find the best of their form uh, through this course of this competition? Mind you, that's pretty impressive there. Uh, I think it's better than any other year. I mean, they're, they're just putting everything, everything together. It's, a, it's an incredible watch. Uh, the worst thing is... Every team's got a good chance of beating them with sort of 15, 20 minutes to go, and then the Crusaders just turn up another gear. I mean, the beautiful play here. I mean, Richie, he just seems to come alive with 15 to go. Incredible. Yeah, and they're still finding set-piece things that they can actually attack off. I mean, those first couple of weeks when they came out and they scored against the Hurricanes, and the Hurricanes actually came back. So every team thought, you know, we've got them on the ropes in that last sort of 15 or so minutes. But they just seem to take it to another level, you know, and then, and then just, just sort of, um, you know, bounce away, which is pretty impressive. JK's just sort of staring things down right now, trying to work out what he's going to say. I don't want to talk about them. You don't want to talk about them? <laughs> Why to come down to the final league. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you want to talk about them? Because they're setting the standard. Um, they continue to, to talk set about the how standard. good they are. To oh, be well, yeah. <laughs> and that's why I want to talk about them, because yeah. they are so good. And that's why I've got to love what the Blues have done in Super Rugby Aotearoa in 2020, because to me, they made an impact before COVID. Everyone was waiting to see when it just got down to our teams, our sides, what they would do. They've had a couple of close defeats. I look at them, JK, and I thought this performance was outstanding on the weekend. The best I've seen them play in a long time. Where have they got better and why now are they a contender? You know, the serious thing talking about the Crusaders is you, you get the sense that they're always going to win and be in control. 
And for the first time in a long time, and this includes when I was coaching them, the Blues are playing with composure late. You just don't think they're out of it regardless. And they've got leaders that are stepping up at the right time. Jacko, you talked about Moanga stepping up at the right time, but now we've got Paddy offer. We've got some of these young leaders coming through, stepping up at the right time. Finlay Christie's been the fine of the season. I think he's been outstanding. But they give you confidence where, Mills, sometimes when you watch the Blues, you'd think, well, they're going good for 60 and what's going to happen? But now you just know, you know, they're doing the old counterpunch that the Crusaders do. Right? Score and then, yeah. Yeah, but they score and they get back. What is resilience? Get a score against you, then you go back and you do something, and that's what they did on the weekend. It was seesaw, great game of rugby, their, but... Their consistency has always been questioned, you know, because they haven't had the guys in. And now they've got a... They're built around a, a, a decent forward pack, some really good ball carriers in there um, that, you know, win big moments. Their leader, you know, he's stepping stepping up and he's leading from the front, but they've also got, you know, a guy, you know, Barrett, that's, that they've brought in there, and, and he's just played a really good part. And then alongside that, you know, the Ioani brothers are actually stepping up. So, you know, over the, their experience over the last few years has actually been, you know, um, impressive. And, and has improved that whole sort of culture within the team. And, and I would say the same about the Hurricanes in terms of the way that they are trending, the way they are pushing up. We weren't at 100% sure. Look, there was some uncertainty. Carlos Spencer leaves the coaching staff. But they've had some leadership come in and the return, Jacko, of Geordie Barrett seems to have inspired them to find new confidence and some of their best players. Adi Savia, Nani Lamapi have all stood up. Yeah, right. Like Geordie's really stepped up. You talk about him. He's played a few positions, but he... You know, there was a big thing around him this year, I think, about what position he was going to play. Is he the, the player of Bodie? You know, I think he's really taken this team and, and led them really, really well. I mean, Perinara, we've talked about him a bit with uh, referees and stuff. But, geez, he, he gives you everything. Going to 10, I think, is really good as well for that late bit of the game. It just really shows how versatile he is and how well he does it. Everyone was wondering what would happen after Bowden Barrett left. The fact that, for me, it looks as though that Jackson Garden Bash have stepped up when they needed to. They've found some solidity, but even in their Ford pack, young guys stepping up, Mills. and You know, I think we've got to be incredibly optimistic when you're sitting and talking here about our depth across the country. Mm. And they're the side you're going, you know what, uh, they're the ones that are lifting up, given the performance of other sides. Oh, they've got a good balance in there as well. You know, we've got Dupacy, Karifi, and also you know, Adi Sabe you know, showing the way. But, you know, how impressive was, I think, was the bye before they went into that Chiefs game. And all of, you know, they're under the pump as well, just like yeah. the Chiefs. They both needed to win. They had two losses in a row, both teams. And look how fast, you know, one win has done to them. You know, one, you know they've lost it, they lost a coach in Carlos Spencer. So they've gone through a little bit of adversity in that, in that break. But, man, they've, they've been the most, you know, they've, they've performed the best out coming out of that buy and sort of almost pushed on now. They're contenders. Oh, I'm with you, Mills. You know, we were talking about Carlos left, must be something going on, they've lost, you know, and the Chiefs and them were like that, and here they are. And they've built it, I believe, on on the back of their defence. The defence has been really solid, getting off the line, tacking. Nani got angry for a couple of weeks in the row, which scared the whole world, yep. including me <laughs> on yep. the couch. Yep. But, you know, he, he was outstanding when they needed it. Um, you know, Umanga Jensen's come in and taking his opportunity, and that's what you need. You need your old guys stepping up. You know, Artie's been outstanding. I mean, where do you play him? We've got, we, we've got some really good problems moving forward for the North-South. And guys who have been, you're not sure where they're at, the likes of the Ioani brothers for the Blues, all of a sudden just finding fantastic form. Great. After the break, we catch up with the Black Ferns coach, Glenn Moore. He is in the studio. He's just finished a camp. We'll find out how many he tested, how many he broke, what he's got. But we've got tickets to give away to our games this weekend. The Hurricanes and the Chiefs, and it's the Highlanders and the Crusaders. Go to, of course, the breakdown at sky.co.nz to be in to win those fantastic tickets and get along to the great action up at Super Rugby Aotearoa. Yes, three weeks to go before the Farah Palmer Cup kicks off once again. Glenn Moore, the coach of the Black Ferns, welcome back. Great to have you in the studio with us once again. You've had a camp, run me through it. What did you put the girls through and how ready are they to get back into Farah Palmer? 
Oh, they're excited about being back in Farapama. I mean, uh, you know, there's been a big emphasis since COVID on the club club scene and uh, you know we've seen some really good footy there and uh, you know some real good young talent uh, starting to show up through there and uh, you know the Farah Palmer Cup is going to be really critical for us as we lead into the World Cup next year. And of course the standard is going to change because everyone's available, Sevens players come back into the frame, some of them have been camp. You are just over a year away from a Rugby World Cup. For you what's important now? What is it that you're looking for in the next couple of months and what have you asked of the girls that you've had in camp in the last couple of days? Oh, the message really is uh, is to go back to the FPC and and really bring intensity. And we've, you know, we're working hard on increasing our skill level. Uh, you know, we certainly want to play a tempo game, and uh, you know, we've 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 done a bit of work at reshaping our attack and and doing a b little bit more changing of our defence structures and that. And then we're we're obviously watching closely what's happening in Super Rugby around the breakdown, and um, you know, still. Still playing around with that a little bit, you know. We've um, we've certainly started investing in getting some uh, wrestling coaching into the players, and uh, you know they had a good workout with that today as well. So, yeah, we're doing a few things differently. Always tough, I suppose. You come into a pre-competition Far Palmer Cup and have a camp, but then they've got to go back into that. Is that is that going to be enough time to, to get them ready? And how much influence do you have on, on the coaches in, in that environment in terms of what you want to achieve out of the girls? I think, firstly, Mills, that's what we've got. You know that's the time that we've got, and uh, you know we've got to use that wisely. And you know we have we have good relationships with the FPC coaches, and you know there was a few of them out um, at the camp over the last uh, two and a half days, and you know they'll they'll work with us, and and uh, you know we need to work together, and um, you, you, no different to how we work with the with the sevens coaches as well. You know we we're we're all about winning pinnacle events and improving the game. The Sevens girls would have been disappointed about the Olympics being cancelled, Glenn, and, and them coming back into the squad next year, there's possibly Women's World Cup and Olympics. I mean, how do you start managing that? Because I would say that oh, some can't cross over, but those that can are going to be pretty special. Yeah, and, and look, there's still a window there where we think uh, that can happen, um, and, and we're working towards that. Uh, and, and this year's going to be a big, uh, you know, really important for them, you know, you'll see them all going back into Farah Palmer Cup and, you know, really exciting to see the likes of uh, Portia, Tyler Nathan Wong, etc. Going, going back to their roots in Northland. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's great to see that and, and, you know, I thought the FPC last year had really improved and I, my expectations would be it will improve again this year. England, France, normally our biggest competition at this level. I mean, what are you looking for to try and keep the gap? I mean, is, is it a physical thing, trying to keep in, increasing skills? I mean, what are you looking for to change the game? Well, I think, I think we've got to keep improving our scrum for a start. I mean, uh, both, both the English and, the, and France have been good in the, good in the scrum. And the other area, well, one of the other areas that we've identified is, is actually our kicking game. And, uh, you know, we, we like to play um, un from unstructured <laughs> situations, but, you know, if we can get good purchase on our kicking game, get it back with a bit of a bonus and becomes a bit unstructured, then, you know, that's going to be good for us. I suppose you look at the, you know, possibly in November, you know, test against the, the Australians and that, I mean, but how much will you have to rely on, you know, the the, the years that you've played against in the, in the past for, um, you know, analysis stuff? Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's as much as we've got, Mills, so, um, you know, we don't know when, when they're going to get away with the, the Six Nations. Um, but look, as we sit right now, you know, we know that the Six Nations competition that they, those two teams in particular play in is a good competition and it always worries us as coaches that they've got that competition. But as we sit right now, um, we've probably got the edge in that we are playing and uh, none of them are. So, um, you know, our players have come, come back in after COVID and they're in good shape. Some of them are getting PBs and... Um, you know, the quality of what was put out today and that little hit out we had was, uh, was really exciting. And one of my favourite players, I think uh, she was probably one of the best wingers across both male and female last year, Portia Woodman, being a little bit set back with, with injuries. How's she looking? Is she getting back to it? Yeah, well, she's, um, she wasn't at the camp, but uh, she's, I know she's hungry and she's excited. I've, I've had a catch up with her earlier in the year and you know, she really wants this to be a good year. And, and like I say, you know, f for us in the Black Ferns environment, whether it's in the sevens or in the, in the 15s, it's about winning pinnacle events and it's about, you know, um, in increasing 
uh, our brand awareness and, and um, improving what we're doing in the game. Glenn, New Zealand rugby worked hard to put a schedule together in 2020 and you're probably, in all likelihood, going to miss a lot of that. So what is it you've got planned for, for next season in preparation and the number of test matches and do you believe it's going to give you the level of competition you need going in? Yeah, well, look, once again, that's to be finalised. But, you know, NZR have, have, have worked really hard, as you said, this year. You know, we had eight test matches set out. Uh, seven of them were in New Zealand. We are really excited about that. But, you know, next next year we, we'll probably... Well, we'd, we're down to play in a, in a competition um, in Canada, which would be Canada, uh, US, Australia and ourselves. And, uh, you, you know, there's, there's still a chance that someone like the English or France could be here as well through the year, which is an important competition for us leading into the World Cup. And, you know, we, we know that the World Cup will be a lot harder to win this time. And, um, you know, it's, it's all very well having home advantage. But I think, I think, and we've spoken about this over the last couple of days, the additional pressure that comes with that and being at home is something we have to manage really well. Have you talked to anyone maybe from the All Blacks in 2011? Has that been a conversation you've thought about having just with dealing with that, that, that expectation of a home fans which know you're capable, you're good enough to go out and win, but all of a sudden that added pressure. Are those conversations you might have? Yeah, look, I think those com conversations will keep, keep going, but there has been some initial conversations and... Uh, you know, there's a, probably a lot of learnings there that we can take and, and we're going to have to do that. And, um, you know, we're well aware of that. You know, we've got, you know, there'll be a lot of pressure of, you know, families, connections, all these sorts of things. And, you know, being in hotels for long periods of time. So, yeah, we, we, we're trying to connect up with all the various people to make sure that we're well attuned. And you, you, you talk about, you know, your, your scrum and your, also your kicking game, but you brought some powerlifting and some, some wrestling into your camps. What's, what's that about? Is it a, a point of difference for you guys? Well, we're looking for point of differences. We're looking for things that are going to give us an edge. And, you know, we've got some, we've got some big athletes. And, uh, you know, we, we had a good session today with, um, with an Olympic lifting coach. And um, we're, we're looking to really improve on those techniques and... You know, if that, if that ends up making us stronger, then that's a good thing. And, and we spend a bit of time on the mats with the wrestling and that as well. And, you know, there was a bit of good stuff happening there. <laughs> Any innovation like that when, when you were coaching with JK at the Blues? You know, when you had that opportunity? Is that the sort of thing he was wrestling, into? Wrestling, mate. Really? Well, you know, I mean, was, did you throw ideas JK's way and then all of a sudden it's like, well... Yeah, he Why was, don't we do he, dancing? He, 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 <laughs> he was pretty keen for us to be wrestling. <laughs> uh, 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 Glenn, it's always great to have you on the show. Always great to get an update on where you're at. We are hopeful, of course, the Laurie O'Reilly Trophy once again between you and the Wallaroos. But, you know, I think for me, um, the quality and the way the game has changed and continues to improve is so very, very important. Let's go to the notice board. Bernie, bring you back in. What's coming up this weekend? Well, Jeff, this weekend it is well-being round in Super Rugby Aotearoa. The message is connection in our communities and how something as simple as a handshake can support well-being and mental fitness. Back in 1990, me and my good friend and teammate Vainga Tungamala expressed our connection and friendship with a fun handshake in front of the Eiffel Tower. And 30 years on, it still brings a smile to my face. This week, we're encouraging our rugby whānau to take the time to connect with each other during our Investec Super Rugby Aotearoa Wellbeing Round. For our super players, a personalised handshake, fist bump or greeting can show the powerful connection between teammates. For others, that could mean heading down to a club match with family on the weekend, calling a friend you haven't spoken to in a while, or something as simple as a handshake with your mate. So take some time this week to do one or two things that make you feel connected to the people and places that are important to you. Great initiative. Well, two rounds is all we have, people, and Super Rugby Aotearoa is reaching crescendo level. Round eight, the Canes are at home and they must beat the Chiefs to stay in the hunt. Coverage here on Sky from 6.30. And Sunday, we're in Christchurch for the Southern Derby. Simple maths, really. If the Crusaders beat the Highlanders, they'll have the trophy stitched up. We have tickets to both of those matches. Hit us up on the email and we'll do our best to sort you and a mate out for those matches this weekend. You're always committed to the games. You're always right there. You're always with the Chiefs. I want to know how far you'd go, Bernie, though, because I've just we found this before the show. Katie Brown works over in Australia. Did you see this, Katie Brown? Is this a loaded question? It's not a loaded question. Let's have a look about... that's. So she went out and played for the Rabbitohs in the NRL competition, and then two hours later, 
Makeup on I tell you television. What, I look right like there. that after an hour with this lot. So oh, the, oh, come no on rugby now, game required. Just an hour <laughs> What studio. are you on about? <laughs> come on now. Let's be. Bit by free you, I, I'll tell you what. Are you, are you up for that final game? We're talking about the possibility, you know, the Crusaders and Blues at Eden Park, 45,000 people on hand. Would you up for that? What do you reckon? Should Razor put it on the line? Oh, I'd love to see that. <laughs> You'd love to see it? And who would you have? I'd go the Blues. Well, you'd go the Blues, eh? Go the well, Blues. And we shouldn't forget Jacko as well. Got named this week part of the coaching side for Fiji. Who are you there with? Who's your team? Uh, Vern Cotter, yep. Daryl Gibson and Jace Ryan from down south. So, good team, you know? Good so, team of people. Oh, slipped in there well, and uh, look after the refs, So, I run me, how many weeks is that in Fiji? <laughs> Well, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> we'll do a show. I'll go up tomorrow, I think. We'll do a show. It's about 13. Yeah. It's like a show it. in Fiji. I like it. Oh, we're, going, we're taking it on the road to Fiji. You've been Brody. trying to get up to Hawaii, trying to get up to Fiji. I'll tell you what. Master, thanks to everyone, as always. You've got something left? Oh, just the captain's challenge. Oh, he wants another captain's challenge. He's going to oh. keep going. He's going to keep going with it. Thanks very much, Jacko. Thanks very much, Glenn. Thank you so very much. Well, pulling us to look forward to over the weekend, but let's take one last look, as it is, for one of our very, very greats of the game in New Zealand. Mm.